the way Israel defends itself matters. When we carried the resolution in the federal parliament, we specifically called for the observance of international law in all instances. Uh, now, the concerns from the community, I think we're now in the order of 6,500 people who've, who've died in these bombings. Uh, and that's before you get to the issues that are separate from the bombings, but protect, potentially in terms of human rights, uh, even more significant, uh, which if you go back to the the first days after October 7, when the Israeli Defence Minister referred to a complete siege, he used the term human animals, and he said there would be no food, no water, and no fuel into Gaza. Now, in my part of Sydney, people are not simply getting their information through the media, they're getting information directly from the ground on Gaza. Uh, it's coming through WhatsApp groups. People are getting updates. People are seeing horrific images updated every hour on their phones. And what people are telling me is the concept of being having access to clean water for many people has already ended. Uh, the concept of having available water at all uh, may well for many people be in the final days now. There, There is an aquifer in Gaza, but that aquifer is saline. Uh, it's dependent on desalination. If neither fuel nor water is provided, then people say to me, who's going to run out of water first? The family that's evacuated because their home was bombed or the Hamas fighter? Uh, who's going to be more affected by the f impossibility of importing medicines? Will it be the Hamas fighter or will it be the people in a hospital? Uh, the people in in the area say to me, uh, you know, when fuel runs out, desalination stops. But also in a hospital, you know, who's going to have the backup power kept separate from the supplies, the Hamas fighter or the people on life support or a baby in an incubator? The impact of that decision is ticking. It's being felt now. People are already, on the information that's coming to me from people on the ground, are already much sicker as a result. And while it hasn't had the same attention as the direct bombing, in terms of the humanitarian impact of that siege, uh, we, we, are, we are moments away from horrific impacts there from all the information that's coming to me from the community. I've uh, heard people describe it as a genocide. Do you see it that way? I prefer to provide the facts as I just did, and I think your listeners will will find their own words to be able to describe it. I, I think when we go straight to do we use this word, do we use that word, we end up in an argument about linguistics. What I want to talk about is what's happening to individuals. And, and, the, and what you're the saying the is that that's not you – are raising the alarm in relation to the blockade. You're saying that the blockade is having is a humanitarian disaster. Is that what you're saying? The, the blockade has been there for in the order of 17 years. Uh, there has been since October, and I'm not understating the problems with that. But since October seven, there has been a siege, since as announced by the Israeli Defence Minister. Since October seven. The announcement was no food, no water, no fuel. And for all the information that is coming to me from my part of Sydney, from the community that I represent, the people who are going to be most affected by that, the people who will die first as a result of that, are not Hamas. They are families who live in Gaza. Many of them live in Gaza already as refugees, who are now refugees again because they've evacuated. I've had people tell me of family members who evacuated from the north when they were told to uh, and then faced bombing on the way while they were seeking to evacuate. We need to be able to distinguish in the debate in Australia between Hamas and Palestinians. There have been too many occasions where the two have been conflated uh, and the military conflict is meant to be against Hamas. Canterbury Bankstown Council has voted to raise the Palestinian flag until a ceasefire is declared in Palestine. That's in your electorate. Do you support it? 
I support the decision completely. Why? You, you need to understand, in my part of Sydney, people are watching every day death. They're watching every day images, sometimes of people they know, often of children. I had a professional woman say to me the other day, she has never seen so many images of dead babies in her life. Often the images they're seeing turn out to be of people they know. Everybody in, if I go through the suburbs across from, from Belmore, Lakemba, where I live in Punchbowl through to Bankstown, pretty much everybody knows somebody who has lost someone. And until the council made that decision, there was nowhere in Australia where those colours were being acknowledged as worthy of grieving. So when the councillor, Coda Saleh, who's my local council, councillor brought forward that resolution and then the mayor, BLL Hayek, uh, supported that resolution, which I might add was supported unanimously, they were truly representing the grief that is in the community. And once again, it is not the Hamas flag that's flying, it's a Palestinian flag. And it's a flag that gives people the chance to know that there is recognition and not selective grief. We can't say we only grieve for certain people who are slaughtered. We can't have a situation as a nation where we only formally acknowledge particular deaths. What happened on October the 7th was horrific and was rightly condemned by the parliament and condemned by me, the condemnation of Hamas. We can't have the condem that condemnation be added to by saying, as a result of condemnation, that's somehow weakened if you grieve for anybody else. That's somehow weakened if we do something to acknowledge okay. the Palestinian loss of life. So we know that the Opera House was lit up in the Israeli flag colours. Do you think that was the right call? Look, the the decision that was made, whether... look. I, I agree with what um, Matthew Thistlethwaite said to you on Q&A the other night. Uh, n not all the listeners might have watched the episode, but when Matt said as a, as a general rule with the Opera House, uh, we, the more we start to return it to an arts and cultural precinct, uh, and it got to the point where it's being used for commercial advertising as well, um, that's the, the proper use for the Opera House and it's sensible for us to start considering getting, getting back to that. The concept of having places where uh, people were able to grieve with the Israeli colours, with the Israeli flag, I respect absolutely. Respect absolutely and don't disagree about having places to do that separate to a decision about the Opera House. But in the same way, we have had, until Canterbury Banks Town Council made that decision, no parallel for the grief of Palestinians. And I'm really glad that the council made that decision. I'm very proud that it was my local council. And should it happen more broadly in Australia at the moment, given the numbers that you have pointed to? Uh, I, I suspect it will. I suspect it will. And no one should view that. And, and some people will say, look, any, yeah, there's a really immature debate that we often fall into where it says if you acknowledge anything in favour of the Palestinian people or a claim that if in any way you acknowledge that there is a history that began before October 7, that somehow that's making excuses for Hamas. It's not. It's simply the case that people have a right to be able to grieve when innocent life is lost. And the, the concept of competitive grief, uh, which mm. certainly hasn't, hasn't driven any of the interviews on this program, but has driven some of the media is something that I don't want to see in Australia. I, I believe we do have the maturity and we need to have the maturity to does have it, the respect for each other's grief. Does it also mean that your government needs to have a tougher line on Israel's bombardment and deprivation, as you say, water and food of the Israeli government? You need to use, you are right now, but everyone needs to be using stronger language, language to condemn it. Uh, I think the words that I referred to early, earlier from Penny Wong yesterday were highly significant, uh, highly significant. She didn't uh, call I, for a ceasefire, it was a pause. That's right, she called, called for a pause and the Australian government acknowledges that any country in the world after an attack like Hamas uh, will, will want to respond directly to Hamas. Uh, that said, 
We want to protect every civilian life, and that includes civilian Palestinians. We want to make sure there is a proper humanitarian response. We don't want to see people starving. We don't want to see people without water. We don't want to see hospitals without power. Uh, we don't want to see... And, 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 and we also want to be able to help get people out. I heard the interview earlier on this program today uh, with respect to the government trying to get people out of Gaza. Uh, we, we have been able to get people out of Israel. We have been able to get people out of the West Bank. Uh, of course, at the moment, no one can get anyone out of Gaza. And so while the government's still making best efforts there, uh, there, there are people who Australia has a direct responsibility to who we want to help get out. Uh, but there's also people who simply because uh, we have a strong view about the treatment of civilians who have no direct personal link to Australia, but we still want civilians to be safe. Just brief uh, answer on this, if you can, because David Spears is waiting in the US to speak to us. Human rights organisations and legal experts have increasingly described Israel's policies towards Palestinians as apartheid. I know you've been there. You've been to the West Bank. Is that how you see it? Um, look, once again, I don't want to get into the debate about the label. Certainly the description you gave is a description that Desmond Tutu had used. Um, it's not a, a description that we use as a government, but let me just give this example. I've been to the military courts in the West Bank, uh, military courts uh, where uh, Palestinians are tried within the order of a 99% reported conviction rate. Uh, if two children 